All right, Julie Janae, thank you. Let's bring in criminal defense attorney Michael Bixon. Michael, good morning to you on this Friday. Let's talk about what the judge has in front of him, some pretty big decisions, those phone calls, medical records, and criminal history of the victim, Ahmad Arbery. Let's start with the phone calls. What's your take, in or out? I think they're going to get in. Um, I think there's a very good chance. When you're talking about jail calls, generally they're almost always let in, even if it's to a lawyer. I mean, if a jail individually decides they're not going to let them in or the county, that's different. But most of the time, if somebody even calls me, those are going to get in, which is a very dangerous thing. So I tell everyone, if you're going to make a call, be very, very, very careful about what you say, because most likely it's going to be used against you. What about the mental health records and the um, run-ins with police that Ahmad Arbery faced in or out? So as far as the mental health records, I think that there's a very good chance that they're going to get the diagnosis in. I don't think that they're going to get all of the statements made um, by Mr. Arbery in, um, but I do think the diagnoses are going to be allowed in. The criminal records, this one's very tough, and I feel like it really could go 50-50. I'm leaning more towards the judge is actually going to let them in, maybe for limited purposes, but I do think there's that possibility. Interesting. Um, all right, let's move on to Minneapolis, Minnesota, where uh, there are new developments in the trial of the three former Minneapolis police officers charged for their alleged role in the death of George Floyd. Thomas Lane, J. Alexander King, and Tutau are all charged with aiding and abetting both second-degree murder and manslaughter. All three defendants waived their right to appear at a pretrial hearing yesterday, but their attorneys were there, and they argued some very important motions on their behalf. Also there, there were no cameras, but Court TV legal correspondent Chanley Painter was there. She has the latest on the arguments and the biggest headline coming out of the hearing, a new trial date. Hey, good morning, Ted. Big news coming out of Minneapolis yesterday with the continuation of the trial of all three former officers charged in connection with the death of George Floyd. It is now in March of 2022. Judge Cahill made this motion sua sponte, saying that he felt more space was needed between the pervasive pretrial publicity of Derek Chauvin's trial verdict, his sentencing coming up in June, and the pending federal charges of all four former officers. He also said that it made sense to have the federal trial first before the state trial because harsher penalties are in the federal level for what they are charged for. The defense attorneys did not object to this motion. Of course, the prosecution did put an objection on the record, but understood Judge Cahill's reasoning for the continuance. Other than that, two major motions were taken up in court and argued before Judge Cahill. Hill first had to do with former officer Tu Tao claiming prosecutorial misconduct in pervasive leaks to the media, particularly the plea negotiation for Derek Chauvin last May, that he would agree to plead guilty to third degree murder in exchange for 10 years. That was quashed by William Barr. Well, they're saying that and other leaks have tainted the jury pool for the trial. They want an evidentiary hearing that would bring all the prosecutors into court to ask whether or not they are the source of the leaks to the media. The judge did grant the right to that hearing, but advised or suggested to the prosecution to submit affidavits instead of having to be called to the witness stand. Another major motion from former officer Lane requesting use of force incident reports dating back 30 years, arguing they want that information to impeach the testimony they expect during the trial from law enforcement officers and use of force experts about the duty to intervene. And they suspect that there is no report in the last 30 years of an officer intervening, and they want to use that in their case. The prosecution objected to this as irrelevant and overly burdensome. The judge ultimately took it under advisement, saying that he would, however, like to know how much effort it would take to get five to ten years of information from those incident reports. That's the latest here from Minneapolis. Ted, I'll send it back to you. All right, Chanley, thank you. Uh, still with us, criminal defense attorney Michael Bixon. Lots to discuss on this one. First, your reaction to Judge Cahill saying, yeah, let's push this thing back because I am concerned about the pervasive media attention during the Derek Chauvin trial, and we need more space, that the time from here till August just isn't enough. This would be prejudicial. Your take, was this a good decision by Judge Cahill? Absolutely. 
Absolutely. I mean, it, it was difficult enough during the Chauvin trial to sort of engage the jurors and question them with everything that was going on, all the publicity, all the media. A lot of that stuff can really tamper a jury and affect the outcome in a case. And for a judge, that's the last thing you want. You don't want to go through a really long trial, especially in this case now where you're going to have multiple co-defendants for the same issues and deal with all this media publicity. I think it's the right move to take it and separate it a little bit from the Chauvin trial and sort of let things cool down. And then, you know, you can call in jurors again and do voir dire and it makes things a little, little bit easier. Prosecutors um, did file um, um, a dissent on, on record, but you gotta think that they're happy too, because let's face it, they're now letting the feds go first. And this case against these other three is much different than the Derek Chauvin trial. They're the others. They're not the guy with the knee on the neck. And would be more difficult, I would assume, to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. Usually people fight for um, to go first. Um, what's your take on the state, basically, and the judge ordering that the feds go first with their case before the state case? I think it's the right move for the state. Uh, I mean, for the defense, obviously, they're in a very difficult position where now they have two different entities trying their, their clients for essentially the same thing. And, you know, for those of you who don't know, double jeopardy doesn't apply to both state and federal. So you can be tried essentially for the same thing, both by the federal government and the state government. And that's what's happening in this case. Uh, for the state to take a step back and say, hey, let's see how the feds do it. I think that, I mean, it doesn't hurt their case at all. It only helps it. And if the feds are able to secure conviction, it could possibly help the state later on as well. If the feds get a conviction, would you anticipate that the state case, case is, is plead out? I don't think so. Um, I think that realistically, if, this, if the feds are able to secure a conviction, uh, realistically, the defense really wouldn't have much to lose by going forward on a trial to make sure that they preserve all of their appellate rights, both for the federal as well as the state case. That makes sense. Other things coming up, the um, Tutau and his lawyers, they want to bring in prosecutors. Um, they want them under oath on the stand uh, to talk about leaks. Usually these um, requests are denied, but in this case, Judge Cahill says, all right, you know, I'm going to let you have this evidentiary hearing, but he's not asking prosecutors to come in. The written brief is a lot different than the cross-examination, is it not? So do you think this is much to do about nothing or is there some there there? It's very unusual to have uh, attorneys in a case write out an affidavit claiming that they did or they didn't do something or have them take the stand and testify about it. Uh, usually you don't have attorneys become witnesses in a case. And in some states, you're not even allowed to, in fact. Um, in this case, though, I think the judge is making the right call. If it is proven that the prosecutors did some type of misconduct by, le uh, by uh, leaking the alleged plea deal that was uh, offered to Chauvin, that had a dramatic imp impact on the case. And I think that it definitely could prejudice some jurors, and it definitely could affect the outcome, uh, at least for Chauvin, as well as uh, for the trial that's coming up as well. So I think it's smart on the judge's part to say, hey, let's tackle this issue. Let's make sure that, you know, no one actually did leak this information, because if they did, I definitely do think that it is prosecutorial misconduct. And if the defense later on is able to show that they actually did leak it, and now you have some type of affidavit from those prosecutors saying, oh, no, 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 we didn't do this, that's a very big problem for the state. Mm, absolutely. All right, moving on. Next week, we are expecting to be in California for the continuation of the Robert Durst murder trial.